afternoon. Thank you for attending our season seven finale of Ocean Grand Rounds. I am your host, William Pinnock, and today I could not be more excited to welcome Dr. Julia Marcus of Harvard Medical School, Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Institute, and the Fenway Institute, and Dr. Douglas Krakauer of Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, Harvard Medical School, and the Fenway Institute as they present on using electronic health records to disseminate and implement clinical decision support tools for HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. Dr. Julia Marcus is an infectious disease epidemiologist whose research focuses on improving the implementation of PrEP in the US, including the use of electronic health records and clinical decision support to prompt PrEP discussions and prescribing with patients likely to benefit. You can find Dr. Marcus published in such places as Journal of the American Medical Association Network Open, The Lancet HIV, and American Journal of Public Health. Dr. Douglas Krakauer is faculty in the Division of Infectious Diseases at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, research scientist at the Fenway Institute, and assistant professor in medicine and population medicine at Harvard Medical School. His research focuses on ways to optimize HIV prevention in healthcare settings with a focus on implementing HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis or PrEP. You can find Dr. Krakauer published in such places as The Lancet HIV, Journal of the International AIDS Society, and BMJ Open. This session is being recorded. Attendees are muted upon entry, so please pose your questions through the Q&A or chat box. This presentation will last approximately 45 minutes with 10 to 15 minutes at the end to answer any questions you may have. We will now pass the mic to Drs. Julia Marcus and Douglas Krakauer for piloting clinical decision support for HIV pre-exposure prophylaxis in community health centers. Dr. Marcus, Dr. Krakauer, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for that introduction um, and great to uh, see all of the participants on here today. Thanks for joining us. Um, so uh, Doug and I are gonna split the talk and I'm gonna start, um, I'm gonna do about the first half and then I'll hand it over to him. Um, and what we wanna talk about today is kind of a broad overview. Um, first of all, the uh, unmet need for PrEP in general and specifically in community health centers and some of our work on uh, using electronic health record data to identify people who are likely to benefit from PrEP. And then our work at OCHIN specifically where we piloted um, this approach as part of a clinical decision support tool to improve PrEP prescribing. So just in terms of where we are with HIV epidemiology, these are data that are hot off the press from CDC, which show that HIV rates are declining, which is good news. Um, but we're still seeing about 32,000 infections annually, and rates are not declining as steeply as they need to be to hit uh, national targets. Um, and also, I think a, a kind of key part of the story for um, both HIV incidents and for PrEP use is these really stark racial and ethnic disparities that you see here. Um, so HIV is uh, continuing to disproportionately impact um, men who have sex with men, and Black and Latino populations, including Black women. Um, so just a very quick background on PrEP. Um, this is the use of antiretroviral medications as prevention. Um, and these are medications that can be used for treatment. Um, and about a decade ago, were shown to work for prevention as well. And um, here, the shows take it once a day to stay HIV negative, and now there are actually other ways to take it. Um, but uh, for, for the most part, for everybody, um, it can work once a day. And then for men who have sex with men, um, there's uh, different regimens that can be used. And now we have a new injectable PrEP formulation. Um, and, uh, and this is a... a about a decade ago, when this was first shown to be effective, there were a lot of questions about how this was going to work in the real world um, because of uh, kind of questionable uh, results in clinical trials where people had not been uh, consistently adherent to the medication. But it turned out that in clinical practice, it's actually very, very effective. Um, these are data from Kaiser Permanente looking at STIs and HIV and people who were using PrEP. And based on very high rates of STIs, um, but no HIV infection, um, that, that was suggestive that actually this was really working quite well in the real world. And with the most updated data um, at Kaiser, there are over 9,000 person years of PrEP use and still no HIV infections. And so um, this really is a, a highly potent tool um, that could really curb the HIV epidemic if implemented um, broadly and equitably. So the CDC now concludes that oral PrEP is um, at least 99% effective for men who have sex with men and for heterosexual men and women 
and 74 to 84% effective for people who inject drugs in whom there has been less research and far less use of PrEP. And as I mentioned, there's now um, multiple PrEP product options. Um, there's uh, Truvada, and this is a, a daily pill that can be used in all populations. And I'm not gonna go through all the clinical details here, um, but this is now available as a generic um, and again, can be used in everyone. Um, and then there's Discovy, which uh, has only been tested in men who have sex with men and transgender women. Um, and then more recently, uh, at the end of 2021, um, cabotegravir or apertude was uh, approved um, for all sexually active populations. And this is an injection that's uh, taken every eight weeks and has not yet been um, broadly implemented, but is starting to be slowly scaled up across the country. And uh, just briefly on the CDC indications for PrEP use, um, it's indicated for sexually active adults and adolescents who've had anal or vaginal sex in the past six months and any of the following you see here, partners living with HIV, bacterial STI or inconsistent or no condom use. And then also for people who inject drugs, especially if they have an injecting partner who has HIV or they're sharing injection equipment. And the CDC specifies that, that actually anybody who asks for PrEP um, is indicated for PrEP with the understanding that not everybody is gonna wanna share um, their uh, behaviors with clinicians. And so um, we can just assume that if somebody's asking for PrEP, they have a reason to be um, on it. So this is kind of the main story of, um, of PrEP implementation, which is that PrEP has been used least by the people who need it most. Um, the, there's about 1.2 million people in the US who could benefit from PrEP and uh, the number, this number has been increasing, thankfully, over time, but still, as of 2021, um, that's over a decade of availability, or nearly a dec decade of availability, only 30% of people who could benefit from PrEP were prescribed it. And um, there are some of the, the uh, widest disparities, racial and ethnic disparities, um, that you, know, you see in public health interventions. Um, you see them for PrEP here. Um, with white of, of white people who could benefit, 78% were prescribed PrEP in 2021, and only 11% of Black or African American people and 21% of Hispanic or Latino people. And so, as a result of um, this, you know, somewhat limited uptake, and especially the inequities in use we see some suggestion that PrEP is having a population level impact, but it is not um, as robust as it could be. Um, so at a state level, we see modest associations between PrEP coverage and reduced HIV diagnoses. And then in regions or groups that have very high PrEP coverage, we do see um, larger decreases in HIV incidence. And so this tells us that PrEP really does have the potential to curb the HIV epidemic, um, and certainly is highly effective on an individual level, but its population level benefits have not yet been fully realized because it has not been rolled out as broadly as it needs to be, particularly for marginalized populations. So um, with that in mind, um, in 2019, the federal government launched the Ending the HIV Epidemic Initiative. And um, this is an ambitious initiative to reduce HIV incidence by 75% by 2025 and by 90% by 2030. And it has uh, four key pillars and one of those is about prevention um, and specifically about scaling up PrEP in priority populations. And um, this initiative really focuses on community health centers as being uh, the, the central place where PrEP can be delivered. And here this map is showing um, geographic hotspots that have been designated high priority by this initiative, um, where it, just looking at these um, counties and these states that have high rural, rural HIV burden, over half of HIV diagnoses in the country occur in these hotspots. And so the, the goal really is to scale up PrEP in these regions, among other interventions, um, and specifically focused on community health centers. So one of the key barriers in um, community health centers and really all primary care settings is the lack of PrEP discussions in primary care. They just have not been routinized. Um, and thankfully the CDC in 2021 revised their guidelines such that instead of saying discuss PrEP with people at substantial risk of HIV, it's now recommended to discuss PrEP with all sexually active people. But there's really a long way to go before that actually happens in primary care. And in one study looking at chart reviews, 94% um, of PrEP discussions were initiated by patients. So 
Um, what are the barriers here? Um, providers, of course, report time constraints and competing priorities, um, particularly in primary care, where there are um, conditions that are going to be much more common than HIV, and HIV is not going to be front of mind. Um, some clinicians report limited prep knowledge. Um, some have discomfort talking about um, sex or substance use, and there's some biases that can come up around those um, around those things, and also around race that can kind of compound those biases. Um, and and then also difficulty identifying patients likely to benefit. Um, it's not always easy to know who's at risk of HIV, especially if those conversations about sexual health and substance use are are not happening to begin with. And so um, the CDC and others have put together um, risk prediction tools for HIV to try to help clinicians identify who might benefit from PrEP. And this is one example called the MSM Risk Index that asks uh, just a handful of questions about age, recent partners, um, HIV status of partners, condom use, and methamphetamine use. But these tools have some limitations. Um, so first of all, they're only used if that um, sexual history or substance use discussion happens first. Um, and, and mainly um, have only been developed for MSM. I believe there's one for people who inject drugs and none for women um, have been developed in the US. As you can imagine, they're difficult to use during a busy clinical visit, requires manual data collection and tallying up these numbers and um, you know, clinicians don't tend to do that. And they're only moderately predictive. Um, an area under, under the curve is a way of measuring how well a tool can discriminate be between people who do and do not go on to get a certain outcome, in this case, HIV. Um, and they range from zero to one, and uh, 0.5 is like a flip of the coin, and one is perfectly predictive. And um, the AUCs for these tools range from 0.66 to 0.72. And then um, uh, this is a, a kind of major concern with these types of um, tools. When you just look at HIV risk based on behavioral factors, you're going to underestimate risk in populations where risk is driven more by structural factors, and that includes Black and Latino people, cisgender women, and transgender women. So um, the long-term vision here is um, to use electronic health records to, uh, as a way of prompting PrEP discussions with the patients who are most likely to benefit, and, and ultimately normalizing these discussions in primary care. This is a, an example from the Kaiser Permanente electronic health record that gives the clinician a bunch of preventive services that the patient may need, and then flags the ones where um, the clinician may need to have a discussion with the patient or order something for them, so for example, a flu vaccine. And here, the um, provider is being prompted to have a discussion with the patient about their cardiovascular risk. And this is an algorithm that is built into the EHR that is looking at the patient's demographics and clinical history. Um, and uh, it's automated, and it tells the provider this patient could benefit from a discussion, and then gives them some tools to have that discussion to understand what went into the calculation, um, how to talk about it, and what to prescribe if appropriate. And so the vision here is, could we have something like this for PrEP um, or for even more broadly for sexual health to try to prompt the provider about you know, what this patient may, may need in a way that's automated? Um, and this is a quote from a, a study that we're doing in Alabama. Um, and a clinician in a community health clinic said, having an automated process like that makes it, you get the muscle memory, you get into the habit of doing something and then it becomes routine for you. So the first step to seeing if this is uh, what, uh, you know, feasible is to see if we could use electronic health record data to identify people who could benefit from PrEP, so people who are at increased risk of HIV. Um, and Doug and I did this in two different settings, um, and one was Kaiser Permanente in Northern California, and we used data from 3.7 million members. Um, and we used a, a machine learning approach called LASSO to predict incident HIV diagnosis. And we, we had a um, really good AUC of 0.84, meaning that this algorithm was uh, did a good job of discriminating between people who did and did not go on to get HIV. And then on the right, you can see this graph shows um, on, the, on the top, that's that purple line is our full model, which included a lot of different variables, some of which get at structural factors, as I was talking about earlier, that uh, may do a better job of predicting HIV risk in certain populations. So we weren't just looking at STIs and whether somebody reported they were a man who has sex with men, for example, and those were the simpler models we looked at, um, those other lines. Um, and the full model, including all these other data domains, um, did much better. And I'll show you on the next slide what those variables were. 
Um, but we weren't surprised to see this, that um, bringing in these other variables actually did better, um, especially for Black patients. Um, and uh, the on the graph on the right, the best possible model is going to get the, to the top left corner, and a model that's no better than the flip of a coin is on that diagonal line. Um, so these were the, the predictors of HIV risk that stayed in our model. Um, demographics, not just age, sex, and race, but also where a patient lives and um, the deprivation index in their neighborhood, um, their social history, laboratory tests and results that, again, go beyond STIs, also looking at substance use, medication use, including medications for erectile dysfunction and syphilis treatment, and then diagnoses, um, including psychiatric diagnoses, and then um, diagnoses related to um, HIV counseling, education, et cetera. And then in Doug's study, he um, did a similar, used a similar approach at Atrius, which is a, another general healthcare setting um, here in Massachusetts. Um, and he was able to both prospectively validate his model at Atrius, but also see what happened when he took it to Fenway Health, a community health center that is also in Boston, but specializes in care for sexual and gender minorities. So a very, um, a, a different population. And there was some drop off in predictive ability, which you can see with the, the AUCs getting smaller, um, but it was still, um, it still did translate to some extent across settings. And this schematic shows what the distribution of risk scores look like from the model. And those are kind of like a, a predicted probability of how likely somebody is to go on to get HIV. And most people have very, very low risk scores. Um, this is a very rare outcome. But then at, um, there's this inflection point where a small proportion of the population has much higher risk scores. And those are people who are very likely to benefit from PrEP. And that's where we really want to focus our efforts in terms of prompting PrEP discussions. Um, so when we published these studies, the New York Times published this kind of inflammatory um, article about them um, that asked some questions about, you know, is this is this really okay to do? Should we be um, using computers to judge people's risk of HIV infection? And, um, you know, we pointed out that, and actually the article was not as bad as the headline, but um, we, we pointed out that this is done all the time for cardiovascular risk, for bone fracture, um, for cancer risk, and we don't question it, but we, we tend to think of HIV as special. Um, and in fact, that can be a way of perpetuating stigma um, rather than normalizing um, you know, HIV prevention as part of sexual health care. Um, but it, I think we do need to be um, exploring how to do this as sensitively as possible with both patients and providers. And so Doug has led some qualitative work um, asking, first of all, providers what they think about pred prediction tools for PrEP. And these were focus groups, um, again, done here in Boston and providers anticipated some benefits of tools like this, for example, um, identifying people who would be good PrEP candidates who they might otherwise miss during busy visits, facilitating discussions about HIV risk, and destigmatizing and standardizing risk assessment. And they also expressed some concerns um, about um, negative patient reactions if people don't know why they're being asked about this, potential breaches in confidentiality, and also question the accuracy of model predictions. And we're going to talk about that a bit more later in terms of how that came up at OCHIN. Um, and one clinician um, at Atrius Health said, I think I should probably be offering it prep to more people than I'm offering it to. So in that way, it would improve my practice and have me doing something I'd like to be doing. And then what about patients? Um, these were interviews with men who have sex with men at Fenway and at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, both in Boston. And the themes that came up were that providers would need to contextualize information about risk. Um, so if you give, if you tell somebody you have a 1% risk of it getting HIV in the next three years, that may sound very high to some people and very low to others. And so there needs to be some context there. Um, people had doubts about quantifying risk at a single point in time. They felt like, you know, my risk is dynamic. Um, you don't know what I'm gonna do tomorrow. And some believe that uh, a tool like this could help motivate behavior change. And so a quote along those lines from one participant, I would think an HIV risk prediction tool could be helpful. I mean, obviously, I would take it with a grain of salt, but I think it would help me understand where I am and how I've been doing. Do I continue on the course that I'm on or do I need to readjust? So this is actually where most um, prediction models stop. Um, and there's been this proliferation of prediction models over the last few decades. And most of them sit on the shelf. There's very little prediction model implementation. Um, and there may be reasons for that. It's not easy, um, but we wanted to, to move forward with this in part because the USPSTF has really noted 
this approach as being um, potentially beneficial for prep provision. So they they gave um, prep a grade grade A recommendation, and as part of that, they do a systematic review of the evidence on prep, and they're currently updating it. And in their draft evidence review, they note that instruments that are accurate for predicting risk of HIV could help inform decisions about prep. Um, and they specifically um, point to our two models as these two new instruments that uh, had moderate to high discrimination for predicting incident HIV, and they call for more research on this. And they say specifically that um, we need to evaluate the impact of these algorithms. Um, and so that's what brings us um, to OCHIN. Um, and this was a pilot study that we are close to wrapping up um, called the PREDICT study where we were piloting clinical decision support for PrEP in the OCHIN network in, in a way that in, integrated a prediction modeling approach that I just described. Um, and of course, you're all familiar with OCHIN, so I don't need to describe it, but the aims of the study were first to develop and validate an HIV prediction model that used historical electronic health record data from OCHIN patients to identify patients who would benefit from PrEP and figure out what are the, um, what are the predictors in this population specifically. And then uh, aim two was to build a clinical decision support tool for PrEP in the electronic health record in OCHIN that embeds that model so that um, the tool only appears for, um, you know, during clinical visits where um, a provider is seeing a patient who is above a certain risk threshold in that model. And then the final aim was to evaluate the, um, the feasibility and acceptability of, um, of this approach and also look at preliminary impact on PrEP prescribing, although that's, um, you know, this was a pilot study, and so we had limited ability to look at actual impact. Um, and initially, we had planned to do this in two clinics, um, and in California, North Carolina, and a third clinic um, learned about the study and, um, and ended up joining Midway. Um, so the first step was to build the model um, and maximize accuracy and fairness. And um, so we used lasso regression again, which we had used in our prior studies, and um, it had performed well before, and it's, um, it, it creates a, a more parsimonious model, and it, it's pretty interpretable because it, it um, spits out output that looks like a regular regression so people can understand it. And we actually had a very similar AUC to what we saw in our, our prior healthcare settings where we had done this. Um, the final model had 51 variables, which is um, a lot, and then we added actually more um, because we noticed that there were some differences when we looked at performance by sex and race, and that's what's um, shown in these graphs. These are, um, again, ROC curves like the ones I showed you earlier. Um, and the the models um, the, the model worked better for uh, males compared with females and for non-Hispanic white people compared with non-Hispanic black people, and we weren't surprised to see this. Um, but we did add um, interaction terms to our model to try to improve fairness, and that did help, but it added some complexity. Um, and uh, we also tried, what I didn't note here, um, was that we, we tried adding variables um, on social determinants of health um, that weren't immediately available in the EHR, um, but were available to us as researchers just to understand, could including this data improve fairness? And it actually did not make a difference. Um, and it's also worth noting that, you know, there's fairness in, um, in the model itself, um, and then there's also um, biases that can come up in implementation. And so we're thinking ahead in the future about as we do this implementation work, um, additional strategies that can help promote equity in discussions in terms of who providers um, initiate those conversations with. Um, and then we selected a risk threshold for implementation. And how do you do that? It turns out this is not an exact science. Um, it's, a, it's sort of an art. Um, so ideally you pick a risk threshold in your model where there's no misclassification. So everybody above your risk threshold um, is gonna get HIV and everybody below it is not. But of course that's not how these things work. In reality, you're gonna have some false negatives and some false positives. And um, so we, we have a couple options. So in this uh, graph here, this is an example from um, a tool that predicts risk of malignancy for ovarian cancer. And the green is um, cancer, tumors that end up being benign and red is tumors that end up being malignant. Um, and the threshold minimizing misclassification is shown here. Um, but in this case, you really don't want to miss a malignancy. Um, like that's a really bad outcome. And so 
um, a utility-based threshold that takes into consideration costs. Um, you know, what, what outcome are we looking at here? What's the morbidity and mortality associated with that? What do people value? Um, so that, that threshold may be in a very different place. And in the case of malignancy, it may you know, move somewhere where it's gonna really minimize the risk of a false negative where you miss a malignancy. Um, and so in our case, ultimately, we made the decision based on both looking at the performance metrics at, at different risk thresholds and also talking to providers about um, you know, what made sense from their perspective. Uh, and that was you know, qualitative work that we were doing both at the beginning of the study and throughout. Um, and trying to understand what is, what is the alert rate that is going to be acceptable in each clinic, et cetera. And so that, that's how we ended up making that decision. And uh, let's see, do I, I think we had a, uh, we'll show a slide later actually, a little bit more about the, um, the risk score uh, selection and how we iterated that. Um, so I'm going to pass this off to Doug and I think he's going to share slides on his screen. Okay, great. Thank you, Julia. So um, I'll pick up, let me just make sure we can advance. Perfect. I'll pick up a little bit where we transition from what I might call the, the lab aspect of the project, all the pre-work in terms of building the models and trying to optimize their fairness to um, the actual process of building a clinical decision support tool that can actually be embedded into OCHIN's EPIC installation and then used at the point of care. And uh, this process I would describe as sort of nonlinear in that um, ideally you'd come up with a tool that's just perfect and works great and has all the right thresholds and the rest is history. But in reality, um, it, it's a collaborative and iterative process. And we learned a tremendous number of lessons about how to actually go through this process that we think would be really instructive to share with the group today. So I'll walk you through what that process was like um, and all the steps that we took. One of the things we emphasized is collaboration with OCHIN providers. Um, busy primary care providers are incredibly skilled at preventive healthcare in so many domains. So um, come up with a process that involves both researcher and um, end user input is gonna be really critical to having something that's useful. And we took that as the priority here and had a great experience working with OCHIN. And so this is a screenshot of the tool that's actually been used as part of the, the pilot study. And um, the, the first thing that we did in terms of the prompt is have it be a best practice alert so it pops up on, on the screen here. And we, we had some iterative changes about whether it should be a passive or an active um, type of alert. And again, different providers had different opinions, so it's always a, a, a balancing act to get something going that might be serving the most providers in the best possible way. And so this is what we end up deciding on. And um, the, the alert itself notifies that patients may benefit from a discussion about PrEP. It mentions that CDC recommends this is something for all sexually active patients, but that this particular patient should be prioritized for PrEP discussions because of their EHR histories. And then we have some links to more detailed information about the prediction model, because you can't put everything in the alert itself, and links to a PrEP fact sheet for providers who want to know more information about PrEP itself who may be less familiar at the point of care. And the tool has a couple of different components beyond the initial um, opening alert. If you click and open the PrEP smart set, we had some language to try and frame PrEP discussions using what's called the goals framework, which came out of New York City. And the idea here is to have non-judgmental discussions that are patient-centered and um, try and emphasize things that matter most to patients. And you can see the actual language here that talks about how um, there's a script that providers can actually use verbatim uh, as part of their conversation, or more likely they'll adapt it to be more comfortable using whatever language feels right to them. But it talks about how uh, I'd like to talk to you about PrEP, a safe and highly effective medication that can prevent HIV. Um, and it's for people who may want to take control of their sexual health. And then we talk about some of the groups that might be um, likely to benefit from PrEP. And we tried to do this in a way that, again, did not stigmatize any particular populations, but also lets provider, providers know about groups where this may be most useful as people make decisions. And then after that, we have um, a number of, of parts of the smart set to try and make this as easy as possible to actually get it done if someone decides they want to start PrEP. So in terms of the medications that get ordered, the prescriptions, the lab orders, um, all the ICD codes for billing and documentation, including some templated notes 
So it's all pre-populated stuff where the boxes are checked and you just have to click go and adapt it on the fly. And this kind of efficiency, you know, in my experience as a clinician who also has used um, Epic is really key to getting people to actually do this. So these are some of the components that we hope to make this more useful for providers and that we developed in collaboration with Ocean providers. So some of the um, successes from the pilot study I'll go through now, and, and these are based on qualitative feedback interviews we did with some of the um, providers at our pilot sites. Some of them were also through practice coach check-ins. And um, we've laid out some of the successes and some quotes. So one success is that providers felt this facilitated identification of patients who would be most likely to benefit from PrEP who they might have otherwise missed in their routine practice. So the quote here is the alerts have been very appropriate. It might be a patient uh, where I wouldn't have thought about it myself, but then I look in their chart and think, yes, it does make sense to talk about PrEP. And so um, that's a success. Another one is providers thought it might have supported discussions and prescribing for those providers who may have been less familiar and less comfortable with PrEP in terms of their prior practices before the smart set and the alert started going in Ocean. And so the quote here is the tool itself is great. Once you click into it, all the info is there, all your prescribing options are there and the questions you can ask are there. It has everything you need, which is kind of the one-stop shopping easy model we were going for. It prompted providers to initiate discussions about PrEP where stigma might be a barrier to patients um, initiating those discussions, in, in particularly in settings where there might be some cultural norms that make it particularly uncomfortable. And so one quote from a provider um, said, in terms of HIV disparities and what's causing them, I think this tool is one of the better ways to identify patients and improve access to PrEP. And I think FQHCs need it more than any other type of healthcare organization, especially here in the South in the Bible Belt where patients are afraid to tell providers anything about what they're doing in terms of sexual health. And so um, this is a nice way um, that they felt this could routinize and normalize things and get around some of the stigma related barriers. It could increase communication and relationships among providers and other um, members of the clinical teams. So here in some of the clinics, um, they were using the, the prompts, not just as a one-on-one, -on -one, the provider doing everything, but involving other staff members as well in terms of task sharing. And the quote is that usually we don't interact much with other staff unless it's about a specific patient situation. Having these alerts as a way to speak to other clinic members who I don't usually speak to is essential. We're building a clinical staff together and working toward the greater good for patients. Sorry about that. So establishing these uh, relationships is important. Uh, and I've actually cut off the rest of the quote on my screen, but but the main message there is that um, it can build relationships outside of the one-on-one -on -one patient provider, which is really nice and helpful for these population-based strategies like we're going for for PrEP. So in terms of uh, model implementation, um, uh, there were successes, but also not surprisingly challenges that we've learned from. And so some of the providers felt that the model identified patients that were not likely to benefit from PrEP and as Julia had alluded to before, these are the ideas of potentially false positive alerts. So the quote is that some of them were not very happy about the BPA showing that patients were good for PrEP when they actually weren't. That initial impression might have caused some mixed opinions with providers about the tool. It takes a lot to convince providers to stay positive, keep things hopeful, and let them know we're going to fix this and that we're all learning and it's a process. On the other hand, some providers worried that the model may have missed patients who were especially likely to benefit from PrEP discussions and use, and these are the ideas of false negatives. So I was puzzled because there were obvious patients who were candidates for PrEP, for example, a young man with STD exposure, but I'd look on the best practices and these patients were not targeted. So these are really important considerations. Some providers were hesitant to act on the alerts without more information for a particular patient about specific EHR variables that triggered the alerts the way for like a, a cardiovascular risk prediction tool, you might know their blood pressure, their age, their gender, and their um, family history. They want to know more of the specifics. So it may help to give a little information about why a specific patient was identified. Like for example, I know you guys had your whole model for determining that, but maybe the top three factors that identified the patient, like recent STDs or high-risk intercourse, a little rationale so the providers that are inclined to close the alert may think that's a good point. Those are things I may not have seen or considered. So um, we really took into account uh, very seriously these, these pieces of feedback. And when we first picked a threshold for the tool, and as Julia said, it's more of an art than a science we've learned, the first threshold flagged about 17% of all the patients coming in the door at the pilot sites. And these patients had about twice the HIV risk 
of the average ocean patient nationally and about 20 times the risk for the general population, but it still seemed to be too much in terms of alert fatigue and too many false positives. So in collaboration with providers, we adjusted things and the new threshold flagged about two to 5% um, percent of, of patients overall. And um, this seemed to be you know, much more suitable in terms of alert fatigue and, and balancing the false negative issue. And so the new threshold had about um, uh, identified patients who had about 15 times the HEV risk of the average ocean, ocean patient and about 100 times the risk of the general US population. And that's what we moved forward with. It seemed like a better balance. So one of the things we learned um, from this study here is the concept of trying to expand how providers make clinical decisions about who would be a good candidate for PrEP beyond the traditional heuristics. And I'll give you an example that, that came out of the study. This is a real conversation we had with one of the ocean providers. There was an alert from the model on a 46-year-old cisgender female um, who was married to a male partner, had drinking of alcohol in uh, her health record, lives in Los Angeles and identifies as Latina, and had a herpes simplex virus HSV type 2 diagnosis a few years ago. And the question that came up, should clinicians prioritize a PrEP discussion for this particular patient? And um, if you think about how um, providers usually make decisions about these discussions, it's often based on heuristics, which are cognitive mental shortcuts, which are fast, often unconscious and automatic, and they're very helpful for making fast everyday decisions in clinical medicine, but they can be error prone. And the other kind of decision making is a, a rational thinking approach, which is much slower, more deliberate and conscious, takes more effort, and it can integrate more data um, using complex decisions and information patterns, but it tends to be more reliable than heuristics. And so um, this was sort of an example where the clinician's heuristic was, this doesn't seem to be someone who would be a good candidate for a PrEP discussion, but the objective data using OCHIN variables and, and um, predictive biostatistics showed that this person actually did have a risk threshold that was in, as I said, the top couple percent of the entire population. And so um, this is really one of the key concepts of the study is how do you build trust in these models when the heuristics and the uh, rational approaches don't always match? And we learned that clinicians uh, may not trust alerts and may not access the tools if they don't see the things that they expect to look for as prep um, HIV risk factors like a bacterial STI or other more obvious risk factors. And um, the reason we think it's so important to grapple with this um, issue is that we went back and looked in OCHIN at um, the population of people who had incident HIV diagnoses, and there were over 6,000 that we used to develop the model before the implementation of the study, and only 2% of them had a prior bacterial STI in their OCHIN EMR, meaning that if clinicians only went based on um, prior STIs, you would miss 98% of the opportunities to um, offer PrEP. And this fits with some of the biostatistical findings that Julia mentioned from the, her original prediction model, where the simpler models that don't integrate more variables that take into account other factors besides behavioral um, elements of, of someone's HIV risk, you really can um, miss a lot of opportunities. So one of the things that we tried to do was to um, ultimately integrate both provider heuristics, which are, are not without great value and also are things that providers trust in terms of, you know, in their gut sense and in their bones um, and integrate those with reducing concerns about false negatives. So we ended up um, developing what's called a blended model. And on the left where the blue box is, it's all the variables that the LASA regression put into the HIV prediction model. And the model weighs and balances and integrates all these different variables and gives coefficients that weight them. And then it spits out an estimated risk score, which is you know, what the model had been doing at the start. But then um, based on what we learned from providers, we decided to also um, send alerts if there were some more basic provider heuristic oriented rules, like anyone who identified as a man who has sex with men in their EMR or has a gonorrhea or syphilis or chlamydia diagnosis, except for cisgender women with chlamydia, which um, would align more with the CDC recommended guidelines for PrEP discussions and prescribing. And so this blended model is ultimately what we think moving forward is the best way to balance the issues in terms of predictive performance and model trust and utility, because if people don't trust it, of course they won't use it. Um, so it's an interesting balance that has to be struck. One of the other things <clears throat> that we added to build trust is that you know, when providers wanted to have some of these variables 
like we were saying before, maybe the top three factors that predicted someone's risk score, but that's very challenging in terms of actually programming at the point of care for each individual um, patient. And some of the variables that were actually quite heavily weighed in the model are not ones that are necessarily intuitive for providers. Like for example, if someone didn't have a registered type of insurance status in their EMR record that was predictive, which probably reflects the type of healthcare utilization and some more structural factors as opposed to behavioral factors. But that certainly was a strong predictor. But if we flag that for providers, I think it might, uh, we thought it could confuse people about being a very non-intuitive factor. And there were other factors that were similar to that. So we opted for instead giving people a look under the hood of how the model works in general, so that people could understand the types of variables that tended to flag the alerts without necessarily having all the complexities of the individual um, um, patient variables at the point of care. So this is kind of a nutrition label approach, which is based on some work that's been done out of other AI-based um, uh, clinical tools from Duke. And it shows, you know, why am I seeing this alert? And it shows a brief summary of uh, why this um, PrEP predict tools being fired. It shows the variables that are in the model in terms of demographics, including some of the specific variables, some of the ICD codes and prior STIs and substance use related variables. So these are the kinds of things that I think can let providers get a sense for, okay, now I understand why the, the model might be flagging this patient and they can adapt on the fly to um, um, having a discussion about PrEP. And we also talk about the uses and directions, the benefits of PrEP and um, um, why the model might be useful in initiating discussions. And then we also take head on this fact that there might be inappropriate alerts, i.e. the false positive um, uh, alerts that come up. And we try and talk about how these are, there are structural variables that may relate to sexual networks and assorted of mixing patterns of sexual health as opposed to in individual behaviors. And so um, uh, we highlight that this is part of a study. And this is a way that providers we thought could get a, a more, a, a quick, but also global sense of what the tool actually is. So where did we actually stand in terms of feasibility and preliminary impact, which is of course what people really wanna know in the end. And um, as of January, 2023, which is about a half year of piling the model with a lot of iterative changes along the way, um, alerts were fired for 732 um, patients, which is about 2% of the 33 plus thousand patients that were seen at these sites as of um, the end of January. And um, not surprisingly, PrEP prescribing remained pretty low, um, given that PrEP is still something that's not prescribed that frequently in these settings yet, and that things take time. Even if there's an alert, there's a lot of deliberation about whether people want to start a PrEP medication if they haven't already thought a lot about it. So we're not surprised, but there were some promising early signals. We saw a four and a half fold higher rates of PrEP prescribing in the intervention clinics versus control clinics in OCHIN, um, even though the rates were low. And, um, and then a five and a half percent increase in HIV testing per hundred patients. And with that, I would like to thank doctors Marcus and Krakauer for closing out our season seven of Ocean Grand Rounds with that fabulous presentation. And thank you to everyone who attended today's session. Please be sure to follow the Fenway Institute on Twitter at, at Fenway Health and their website, fenwayhealth.org. Also, be sure to follow Harvard Medical School's Twitter at, at Harvard Med and Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare Institute at Harvard at, at Harvard Pilgrim and Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center at, at BIDMC Health. And be sure to follow Ochin on Twitter at, at Ochin Inc. and over on LinkedIn. In addition, head over to Ochin.org and advancedcollaborative.org to read the latest on our research studies, blog posts, and upcoming events. And don't forget to visit that Ochin YouTube channel to catch up on those past Grand Rounds presentations. And Ocean Grand Rounds will be taking off July and August for a summer break, but we will be returning for our season eight premiere on September 28th with the marvelous guest host, Dr. Sarah Joya, filling in for me while I'm away, as we welcome Dr. Rachel Gold of Kaiser Permanente Center for Health Research and Ocean and Dr. Erica Cottrell of Ocean as they present on approaches to community health center implementation of social determinants of health data collection and action, also known as the ASCEND study. Invitations to this presentation will be sent two weeks prior to the event, but if you're not on our mailing list and are interested in attending this or any future event, please email me at grandrounds at ocean.org. That's grandrounds, all one word, grandrounds at ocean.org. So from all of us at Ocean and Drs. Marcus and Krakauer to all of you, have a wonderful rest of your day, a great summer, and stay healthy out there.